How is everybody? So I was talking to somebody at the reception last night who's a longtime friend of Brevo and who also coincidentally was at the very first summit we ever did, which was what, seven years ago, six years ago, something like that. It was a very small event. It was out in um, Virginia at a place called the Salamander. It was really our, um, our, our first uh, breaking of the ice and trying out a summit. And uh, what she reminded me of is that we were actually talking about AI all those years ago in the context of Brevo and Eagle Eye. And I think one of the big differences, if I had to characterize one change between then and now, is that then we were just talking about it. We didn't really have it built into our products. And today, both companies have it built into the product. So I'm gonna talk about what we're doing with products. I'm also gonna talk about what's going on in the industry. Uh, and I'm also gonna talk about how we got to the point that we're at right now, because I think it's kind of an interesting history. Now, I'm gonna confess that every single image in my presentation, except one, was created by AI tools. And so we're gonna have a little contest at the end, and I'm gonna ask you which image that you're gonna to see today was actually not created by AI. And so at the end, I'm just gonna ask, and whoever shouts it out first, we'll get something great, I don't know what it is, but uh, you'll get something great, okay? Just take my word for it, okay? Um, so what we're gonna talk about, uh, and you can guess this from the title, is both the good and the bad uh, around AI, because you're hearing a lot about both of these right now. So let's go to the origins of history on access control and video, really the security industry, and think about how we got to where we are today. And so we're gonna start really um, kind of at the beginning of time. So early on, security was done with sticks, then after that it was done with stones. And if you had a sharp stone and a stick, you could make an arrow. And right after that, the very next thing that happened in the history of security was on-premise systems, okay? But once mankind became more intelligent and started thinking about better ways to do it, they came up with a cloud. And of course, the next thing after the cloud, Dean was talking about this, was AI. So this is how we got to where we are. We went from sticks and stones to AI, and it's been a very interesting journey. A little bit of a personal uh, retracing for me as I thought about this was really the, the thrill of writing a very first computer program, getting words to show up on the screen of a computer, hello world, some numbers, gas mileage, all those things that you do when you're starting out and learning how to program. And it's easy to forget after many years of working in the industry and writing lots of software, if that's what you did, how exciting it was and how thrilling it was to be able to get a computer to do what you wanted it to do and to then go from there and do more and more interesting things. So we started out getting words on the screen. If we think about some of the hottest news in the industry right now, meaning the AI industry, something called ChatGPT has really caught everybody's attention. So how many people here have heard of ChatGPT? But if you, how many people have played with it? You've played with it? It's a lot of fun to play with, and you can get a lot more words to come onto the screen than just hello world. And we're gonna use some of the output from ChatGPT to illustrate a few points today. So, with all that's been said about it, you hear about a lot of interesting information that's coming out. You hear about these things called hallucinations uh, that are really just the, the computer systems, the AI systems making stuff up based on things that they've read on the internet at the end of the day. And so since we're here to talk about security and AI, and in this case, generative AI, which is built on these things called large language models, what we really wanna know is, does it have any useful information for those of us in the security industry? Or another way to put that would be is AI or ChatGPT smarter than a fifth grader? Now, to test this, I've got a reference here. I've got this book, it's called Five Technological Forces Disrupting Security. And it was written by some guy named Steve. So we're gonna use this and we're gonna compare it. No. I wouldn't do that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna see what ChatGPT has to say about a question, then we're gonna compare it to this book right here and see if they agree with each other or not. So the question I put to ChatGPT, what are five top advantages of using the cloud for physical access control? And let's see what ChatGPT has to say about that. All right, scalability, 
that's good. Remote management, true. Cost effective, yep. Automatic updates, yep. Redundancy and reliability, yep. That's right here on page 195. So I guess from going through this and, and comparing it to this book, we can conclude one of two things. Either both the author and ChatGPT are smarter than a fifth grade, or neither of them are smarter than a fifth grader. So I'll leave that for you to decide. We've talked so far about how fun it is to get words to come out of a computer and how this evolution into AI and generative AI in particular has an awful lot of information spewing at us. Some of it's true, like the examples I just gave right here, but other pieces of it are not. And so uh, that's been a big step forward, but we have to be careful. Uh, words are important. You know, words create beliefs, beliefs create actions. So what these words say when they're coming out are an important part of influencing how people in the industry are going to think about things. So if you think about the answers that just came out here, if they'd been completely wrong or misdirected, your customers might read them and, and get bad ideas or incorrect ideas about what the right way to do security is. So, so these are very important things. So the other part of our industry and the other part of really the, the joy of being involved in everything that we're doing here is getting beyond just words and creating things that are interacting with physical reality, you know, circuits and things like that. And I remember the very first time I connected a battery and a switch and a light bulb and turned it on, how exciting that was and how you build on that, and maybe you connect some motors and you do some other things. And there's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of joy of discovery in all of that. And it leads you down a path of always wanting more. Like, okay, it was fun controlling that light bulb or that motor, but you wanna control more things, you wanna control them remotely. The next thing you know, it has to be a networked thing to still you know, provide that kick and be fun. Then it has to have intelligence inside of it. This obsession, just keeps taking you further and further into remote control and, and, and intelligence, and it takes you right up to a lot of the things that are happening in AI right now with robots, but it also takes you somewhere else, right here. When you put all these things together, you get to a really interesting point in what is possible and what is right around the corner, and that's part of the title of today's uh, address, which is, it's closer than it appears in your side view mirror. That's a little warning you get on every car, right? Like objects are closer than they appear in your side view mirror. But there's that are right around the corner, like, for example, good robots. Right now, there are some very primitive robots that are delivering very simple things. There are some drones that are delivering things. But this is a very great example of the convergence of a couple of those different trends of having more and more intelligence inside the computer, having more and more ability to interact with the physical world and control things that are very complicated like robots and able to do some very important things, especially when we can't get enough people to do tasks like delivering things, we can't get enough people to do lots of different uh, things that we need, uh, picking uh, uh, agricultural goods, for example, is another one where, you know, as a society, we're really hard pressed to feed ourselves right now because we can't find enough people. So the emergence of good robots is a really important part of what's coming out of this entire movement. And as an aside, if you look at this example right here, we've got some interesting challenges coming in access control and security because today, if somebody from United Parcel Service or FedEx comes to your building or your home delivering a package, you have a lot of visual cues that tell you that this person is legitimate, that you can trust them, right? They've got a uniform, which of course you can fake, but how many people run around wearing UPS uniforms? You've got the, the little computer that they carry, maybe they're gonna ask you to sign for something. There was your expectation of getting a package. There are a lot of contextual bits around getting this information that allow you to feel relatively confident that the person who seems to be a package delivery person actually is. In a commercial context, we also need to let that person into a building, right? So somebody might be looking through a video camera, making that judgment remotely. Uh, I know from talking to people at UPS that a lot of them have worked out credentials and codes and things like that for getting into buildings. But how does all that change when the person or the thing bringing that package to your building or your home is actually a robot? 
instead of a person. So I think we agree that having this form of labor and having this kind of delivery is a good thing, but for all of us in access control, we've got to work out how we identify these things, how they get credentialed, what kind of technology they use, how far away does it work from, uh, is it restricted to certain times of day, all the kinds of things that we've worked out for letting people into buildings, but haven't yet worked out for letting robots and other forms of delivery entities into buildings. And we're gonna come back to this. So keep thinking about what this kind of change in society and robotics and remote control and intelligence, think about what that means for access control. And again, this is closer than it looks. These are not that far away. If you think about the kinds of things that are being done already, uh, with drones in particular, with delivering Starbucks on, on university campuses and things like that. We are already here, and the next step is gonna be at your business or at your home. So this is real. So we've talked about a lot of the good things that are coming out of AI, but as everybody knows who's read anything uh, or paid attention to anything that's going on in, uh, in the talk circuits and so forth, there are a lot of people who believe that it's not all good news. And in fact, that brings us, this is um, the famous 22 word statement that was issued by this organization called the Center for AI Safety, mitigating the risk of extinction. That's a pretty strong word from AI should be a global priority alongside other risks like pandemics. That is a really, really strong opinion about the dangers of AI, right? And that is one point of view, there are people equally smart, I would say, on both sides of this issue. So there's an awful lot to, um, to learn from what's being said, and I, I think the jury is out on exactly how this gets managed. And I think part of the answer is gonna be the same way all of other powerful technologies have been managed, which is putting them in the hands of good people, government regulation, watchdog organizations, things like that but we're at the very early stages of that, and so none of those organizations really exist, although the White House has recently taken steps with an executive order to propose uh, a set of rules for guiding AI development and AI deployment in the absence of full legal structures to do that. So this is very much happening right now. So if we go back to what I was saying earlier about Words are important because words inform beliefs, beliefs inform actions. We should go back and now say, can you believe everything that ChatGPT tells you? Whether it's smarter than a fifth grader or not, can you believe it? So I asked it a few things about myself, and I know this might be a little bit hard to read. Um, so here's what it said about me. All right, wrote an article. Okay, so there's several things I invented. Water-powered cell phones is one. Invisibility cloaks for shy robots. That's definitely not true. I did not do that. And then the third one, Wi-Fi boosting plants. That's the one that's real. That's the one that's real. The Wi-Fi boosting plants, that part is real. And so this kind of goes on forever, right? Um, a lot of times these AI tools just make stuff up. Um, and they're very good at making stuff up. And they can make it sound as credible as you like. And so this is the other thing that's going on. And when you go back to people you know, in, in, in the not too distant past, would find stuff out about security solutions, for example, by just Googling things. And where does that take you? It mostly takes you to people's websites, right? And it mostly takes you to product manuals or maybe opinion pieces, but it doesn't take you to a place where stuff just gets made up by an AI. But that's where we are now. And more and more people are gonna be finding out but what we do and what you do through these techniques. So um, this is what can happen, Wi-Fi boosting plants. So you look at this and say, what does that really all mean for security? Well, the fact is there are a bunch of new threats for physical security specifically, and here's a few of them. Deep fakes, everybody's familiar with those. Those are videos and other artifacts that look like they're real. You can get famous people to appear to be saying things that aren't true. You can also do the same thing to positive effect. Um, as my friend Rishi at uh, Eagle Eye was uh, sharing with me to allow yourself to address audiences in a different language with a video that looks very much like you are speaking that language, so that's a good thing, but it's, it is fake. Um, identity theft and impersonation is gonna become much, much easier because AIs can do that kind of work at scale 
whereas a lot of the AI impersonate, the impersonation and identity theft in the past has been sort of a artisanal craft affair where people do one at a time. Now you can do millions at a time. Adversarial attacks on computer networks, data poisoning, vulnerability probes, all kinds of things now that can be automated and be done at a much, much larger scale than ever before. And of course, since our businesses are digital, these are real things that we have to worry about. So all the things that we've worried about forever in terms of cyber threats, uh, network attacks, viruses, phishing, all of those things, those are all gonna get amplified. And so we're all gonna need larger security teams. Those teams are gonna have to have AI tools to combat the AI attacks. And these are the real things that we need to think about in terms of the negative side of AI for what we're doing and the things that we're gonna to have to be prepared for and the things that our customers are gonna ask us about. What about this? Is your product vulnerable to that? What happens if some bots do this? These are the kinds of things that are new that we have to think about. Now, all the threats on here are digital threats, but one of the themes that I've been trying to work on is there are digital things that we worry about, there are words, but then how does that show up when you combine those digital things with physical things that interact with the rest of the physical world. And so before, we were looking at a good delivery robot, and now we have its counterpart, bad robot. Bad robot could come and do any number of things to your building from attacking your reader, maybe getting in, maybe being able to do a million attempts per second on presenting uh, false credentials, all kinds of things. And when you think about it, when you think about um, you know, the society of the future where some bad people have access to this sort of thing, it's the ultimate low risk attack on a building. Low risk in the sense that I personally can't get taught, caught. Uh, maybe they can trace the robot ownership back to me, but I don't have to be there physically. I can dispatch you know, my bad robot to go do some stuff on a security target without me getting caught, without me getting shot, without me you know, appearing to be personally liable for this attack. So this is the other side of the coin, bad robot. So now we get a little bit more to the point of what can AI, but specifically generative AI, do for physical security. I'm gonna talk about a couple of different things here that it can do, and then I'm gonna move on to what Brevo's vision is for uh, this kind of technology and how you can get yourself started and get your team started. So I went back and said, what can AI do for physical security? And this is a pretty long list and uh, it cut off after nine or 10, I forget what I said it to, but I said, don't tell me everything you know about this, just tell me some of the things. So simulation and training, it can be useful for access control, so facial recognition, that's something that's in Brevo's new door station. Video surveillance, ample use of that in the Eagle Eye platform, also Brevo's doing anomaly detection on physical uh, security data from access control. Uh, physical training, uh, physical testing. These are important things that are uh, a great thing that we can do to speed up our ability to train people. Forensic analysis, because then you're looking at large amounts of data and these uh, tools are very good for that. Hardware testing, and the list just goes on and on. There are lots of different things that um, we can do with this. And they all really come together under the topic of, for our purposes, for our intents and purposes, AI equals new tool sets, all right? We all like tools, we all know what tools do. Having more tools is better. So this is a case where AI, what it really means to us uh, when we're practicing security, is having more tools at our disposal if we know how to use them. So natural language interfaces, chatbots, anomaly detection, we talked about that before video analytics and training, being able to uh, have suggested responses. So for example, if you look in medicine, uh, doctors are using these as assistants to get a uh, preliminary diagnosis or a suggested course of treatment. You might imagine security professionals in the moment finding a complex set of facts and turning to this kind of tool to get at least a suggestion, not the decision, but a suggestion on how to deal with the data at hand. So these tools uh, will be developed. We're all working on them now, as I mentioned before. 
The big difference between six or seven years ago and now is that we've started building these tools into our products. So what are they? I lumped them into three groups, analysis, natural language processing or natural language query, and then providing answers. So let's take a quick look here. So we've been doing at Brevo, uh, we've been providing analytical tools for a long time. Uh, the tools that you're seeing right now were in something called Data Explorer. That's getting reworked right now. And the next generation is gonna look fairly different based on customer input. But one of the things that we will incorporate along the way is more AI tools into that analytics so that the user has to do less work to get to an answer. Okay, so that's really is being able to do analysis with less effort. One very specific example of that is natural language query. And so this is another thing we're working on. If you can't read that, it says, who, who entered the room last night between 6 p.m. and midnight? The advantage of this, of course, is that in a pinch, when people are in a hurry, can you show me Adam's access attempts for last week? Did any of my other doors have unusual activity? And what you're noticing here is that every one of these is just a question asked the same way that you would ask the person sitting next to you. It's natural language, right? And the, the advantage there, I mean, aside from uh, the obvious, is that uh, nobody can remember how to use report generators from one week to the next or one month to the next. And so it's very frustrating. Nobody ever enjoyed picking out columns and filters and criteria and, and metrics. What people like to do is to be able to ask in natural language what they need to know. Compound that with, uh, let's call it an emergency situation where everybody's pulling their hair out, something horrible happened, and you're the guy that's sitting there at the administrative console with like 10 people waiting around for you to get the right answer, and you're flustered. This is, a, this is an example where being able to ask things in a normal human uh, expression is a tremendous aid in the immediacy of response to whatever is going on. So yeah, it's cool, but it's also very practical and it's very uh, helpful in doing our primary mission of security. So being able to do natural language queries against the data that's inside of Brevo, next generation, very important. The last thing um, in this group for Brevo's vision for AI, I call it answers on demand. This is really, again, a natural language front end to getting answers out of manuals, out of uh, data sheets, and I'm pretty sure that nobody here likes reading manuals, right? Nobody likes reading manuals. And think about what you're doing, you know, when you use the phrase reading manuals, nobody's really reading the manual. They're flipping through it and trying to find one specific thing, right? You're not reading the manual. You're, you're skimming the manual and trying to find one specific thing. And you don't know what page it's on and you're in a hurry. Maybe you're standing on top of a ladder, right? You need an answer, you don't need a manual. This is like what Dean was saying about nobody wants a video management system. Well, nobody wants a manual. They want the answers that are in the manual. So being able to interact with the entire database of Brevo written documentation and facts about the products is a very important next step in making these things more available. And pointing out the obvious, anything that you can type by way of a question, you can also say into your phone because they all do transcription right now. And so this is really putting you in a position to get the answer you want from the body of information we have on our products using your voice or typing, whatever you like better. That's what I call answers on demand. Last, how do you get ready for this? There's a lot of information out here, and I'm gonna suggest three different ways that I found useful, uh, not only in the case of doing this AI work, but just in general with other things that are new and, and trying to, to find your way in new subject matter. So first, let's talk about yourself. How do you get ready to learn more about this or, or make your exploration of this material a little bit more focused? So. Get a chat GPT account um, if you don't have one already. Uh, that'll put you in touch with these tools. If you do nothing else after you get that account, you need to Google the phrase prompt engineering. This will make every minute that you spend 
playing with ChatGPT much more productive because it turns out there's really a whole body of literature. There are hundreds of eBooks and hundreds of blogs that talk about prompt engineering for different kinds of things. And basically, it's telling you what's the best way to ask a question from ChatGPT. And you can control everything from the length of the answer to um, the style of the answer to specific things you want to see in the answer. It is a very big and deep and new subject matter already, but just do yourself a favor, Google prompt engineering, go to any one of the resources. If you don't like the first one you try, then go to the next one. There's a lot out there right now. And then try one small project. Try one thing that you would like to accomplish, one little thing, you know, have a goal. Uh, it's kind of like learning a language. If you don't have anybody to talk to in Spanish, then you're not gonna learn Spanish very well. Have a goal, uh, do one small thing. And I'll throw one thing out that I saw somebody doing at the last conference I was at. He was running all of his emails to customers through a chat GPT engine to make them sound better and improve his communication with those customers. You can do it in one window. You could probably do it while you're sitting right here because I saw somebody doing it at another conference. But do one small project, pick one goal, and uh, get to that point and then maybe pick the next one. So um, how do you prepare your staff, the people that work for you? There are a lot of productivity hacks that are out there, things that you can get done faster, um, offer training uh, to people or just point them in the same direction I just pointed you, but give them some guidance. And finally, give them some reassurance. I know a lot of people are worried about being replaced by AI. And so if you're talking about it in your company and uh, you have people that are worried that their job is gonna go away because of this, well then, by all means, provide reassurance. And then um, your business, how do you get your business ready? Let's say you wanna use AI as part of your product suite or part of something that you're offering. So usual advice, research vendors, you're here. So you can research Brevo in person, you can research Eagle Eye in person, but make sure you're doing that research against things your customers actually need. In any new field, there are a lot of cool things that get created but they're not really what your customers need. So match up the research that you're doing against customer need, and then ask yourself the question, is it real? There's a lot of fluff out there. Sorry, marketing department, but there's a lot of fluff out there, people making a lot of claims about AI, and you gotta ask yourself, is it real? So thank you all for being here, thank you for listening, and thank you for keeping it real with Brevo and Eagle Eye for so many years. Thank you.